a thousand solid silver bars, hundreds of pounds of gold bullion and coins, a vast pocket of emeralds, gold chains and jewelry worthy of the wealthiest patrons. In all, a treasure worth more than $400 million today, a treasure that sank to the bottom of the sea. This is the story of the search for a missing fortune, the search for the Atosha. On July 20th, 1985, treasure hunter Kane Fisher radioed his father with some extraordinary news. Put away the charts, Kane yelled. We found it. The word set off a champagne celebration in Key West, Florida, at the headquarters of Treasure Salvers Incorporated. For Kane's father, Melvin A. Fisher, it was a momentous day. Forevermore, he would be known as the world's greatest treasure hunter. But it was also a day full of irony. What they'd found on the bottom of the sea crowned a 16-year search, the mother load of a sunken treasure worth at least $400 million. And they found it after the worst tragedy a family can endure. This is the tale of a four-century obsession to find the treasure of a Spanish galleon sunk by an unnamed hurricane in the year of her glory, 1622. It has the romance of the high seas, the drama of an ancient tragedy, the fever of treasure hunters, and the danger of seeking the untold riches of the deep, the treasure of the Atocha. Her name was the Nuestra Senora de Atocha, Our Lady of Atocha, a magnificent Spanish galleon superstitiously christened for a most sacred shrine in Spain. She was built in 1621 and regarded as one of the strongest and safest galleons in the Spanish fleet. Yet it was on her maiden voyage that she met the cruel sea, the victim of a hurricane on her journey home to Spain. The Atocha was not the luckiest of ships, but she was destined for infamy. The Atocha's doomed voyage began in 1622 the annual treasure convoy that sailed between Spain and the New World each year. Because she was a new galleon fitted with 20 bronze cannon and a small army of conquistadores, the Atocha was the guard ship of the 1622 fleet. Her job was to sail in the rear of the entire convoy and protect it from English pirates and Dutch buccaneers. The Atocha left Spain in March 1622, following the trade winds to ports of call in the Caribbean. She reached Cartagena in May, then went to Portobello, Panama, where she loaded treasure through July. After returning to Cartagena, she sailed for Havana, Cuba, to prepare for the long, treacherous journey home. In Havana, 265 people boarded the Atocha, including a royal governor, a high cleric of the Catholic Church, and several wealthy families. Loaded in her hold were magnificent treasures. The bulk of it was Peruvian silver, more than 1,000 solid silver bars. These massive ingots bore the distinctive marks of the wealthy merchants who brought them aboard. One-fifth of all this silver belonged to the King of Spain, and some of it was a head tax from the sale of African slaves. There were also hundreds of thousands of silver coins mined and minted in Peru for the treasury of Imperial Spain. Then there were the treasures of the Catholic Church, hundreds of pounds of gold bullion and coins brought on board by the ranking cleric. He also carried a splendid cache of religious jewelry, which may have been intended for a bishop or even the Pope himself. Wealthier passengers carried doubloons and long gold money chains, each link worth a year's pay to the average Spaniard. One affluent passenger brought all her worldly possessions, including chests full of beautifully engraved silverware, chalices, and plates. There were also crates of oriental porcelain and 15 tons of Cuban copper. The Atocha's registered cargo was worth one and a half million dollars in 1622 Spain, 400 million today. But there was more. Nearly every Spanish treasure ship carried contraband. On the Atocha, 
huge chunks of unregistered gold were smuggled on board, along with a mysterious collection of Colombian emeralds. In total, the Atocha carried a fabulous haul of treasure, nearly all of it plunder from the New World. This material that finally is loaded aboard Atocha has come uh, many, many miles to get there. Uh, but many people have schemed, have suffered, and died to bring it to that point. It's blood money. In 1622, the Spanish treasure fleet was late. It didn't reach Havana until August and wasn't ready to leave for Spain until early September. Of greatest concern to the captain of the Atocha was not the importance of his passengers or the value of his cargo, but the condition of the weather. September was the height of hurricane season. But Spanish navigators believed that certain natural phenomena forecast good sailing conditions. As it happened, September 5th, 1622, was the date of a lunar conjunction. According to ancient nautical beliefs, the Spanish thought this augured well for a safe journey. So on Sunday, September 4th, 1622, under a perfect sky, the treasure fleet left Havana Harbor. In all, 28 ships sailed to the north, reaching for the Gulf Stream. By dawn the next morning, the sky was ominously red, and a vicious hurricane came out of nowhere. Well, this was a fairly intense, but a fairly small hurricane, perhaps even much like Hurricane Andrew, which was a fairly small diameter storm with tremendous power. The hurricane ripped through the entire convoy. For the next 24 hours, the ships fought the wind and sea. Miraculously, 20 escaped and returned to Havana. But eight ships were trapped by the storm, including three treasure-laden galleons, the Rosario, the Santa Margarita, and the Atosha. All were swept toward the treacherous Florida reefs. The treasure galleons struggled, dropping anchor after anchor, trying to halt their course in toward the reefs and the keys, to no avail. Sometime during the night of September 5th, the Atocha broke her rudder and lost her ability to steer. We believe her stern castle was being driven forward. In fact, the ship turned, and with the high stern castle acting as a sail, she was being driven up over the outer reef, stern first. There was a last ditch effort to anchor. The anchors didn't hold. Her bow pounded on the reef, broke her bow. She took on water very quickly, and she sank like a stone bow first. When finally Atocha went down, uh, all those people below were, were trapped. They couldn't, they couldn't survive. Only five people lived, three seamen, a slave, and the ship's boy. They were lashed to the mizzenmast, the only part of the Atosha that remained above water. All the important passengers aboard the Atosha, the colonial governor, the high people in the Catholic Church, the captain, the wealthy merchants and their wives. All those people were lost. In truth, it was the great burden of the king's precious treasure, the greed of the old world, that hauled the Atosha and her passengers to the bottom of the sea. But it was not just treasure that remained untouched for 350 years. The Atosha was a time capsule of Spanish colonial life entombed in her sunken belly were the secrets of a lost civilization. In 1969, 347 years after the Atocha sank, Mel Fisher began his hunt for the doomed ship. Like many before him, the quest was rooted in boyhood dreams of finding sunken treasure. When I was a kid, I'd uh, spend half of my study hall periods in, uh, in the library reading about pirates and treasures and things. 
The lure of sunken treasure led Fisher to undersea diving, and this became his career. In the 1950s, Fisher helped pioneer the development of self-contained underwater breathing apparatus, scuba diving gear. Soon, he opened a dive shop in California. But Fisher could not escape the rapture and romance of sunken riches. In the early 1960s, he sold everything he owned and moved his family to Florida. Together with a small group of like-minded souls, Fisher searched for sunken treasure. Very quickly, he found a lot of gold and silver from several different wrecks, most from a fleet of treasure ships which sank in 1715. Mel was very successful searching for treasure on the 1715 fleet, and then he decided he was going to go after the holy grail of treasures, the Nuestra Señora de Atocha. In pirate lore, the Atocha was known as a ghost galleon because she had vanished so completely. Some believed she had never existed, but Mel Fisher knew she was out there. But where? At that time, everyone believed that the Atocha had sunk somewhere near the middle of the Florida Keys. This was Atocha's first deceit, a little lie that fooled treasure hunters for centuries, Mel Fisher included. It stemmed from the first report of the disaster. The reports of the uh, fleet commander said that the ships were lost in the Cayus de Matacumbi, or the Keys of Matacumbi. Well, today, the Matacumbi Keys are two keys in the central keys, upper and lower Matacumbi. And so they assume that that's where the Atocha was lost. Mel Fisher and others easily located these reports in the Spanish archives and rushed to search the area. For a year, Fisher searched everywhere around the upper and lower Matacumbi Keys. That's where he believed the Atocha had gone down. And he wasn't alone. Treasure hunter Bob Marks was also convinced. I had original documentation, and I had the location of the Atocha and the Margarita as lost off the Matacumbis. And in 1622, the Matacumbis are right where they are today, in the middle of the Keys. And I had 72 documents stating that. So a lot of people for years and years looked off of the middle of the Keys, including Mel. But history played a cruel trick on Fisher, Bob Marks, and other modern-day treasure hunters. It was the trick of time and how places were named. While Fisher wasted a great deal of money and energy looking for the Atocha in the wrong place, historian Gene Lyon pursued the treasure hunt from a different angle. He went to Seville, Spain, where he poured through thousands of ancient documents at the Archive of the Indies. There, he found two important clues that ultimately revealed the location of the sunken wreck. I went to Seville to work on a doctorate in Latin American history. I was over there in the fall of 1969, and Mel said, if you see anything on the Atocha, let me know. After several months of research, Lyon had read enough documents to deduce that the Spanish word Matacumbe, as used in 1622, referred to all the Florida Keys, not just the modern-day Middle Islands. This was the first clue. Then Lyon found a second. I found the salvage papers of the Santa Margarita. And in those papers, at the very end was a sheet which was very worm damaged. It was more more air than paper. The document had been written in 1626 by a Cuban salvage expert who located and recovered some of the treasure from the Atocha's sister ship, the Santa Margarita. Jean Lyon saw the words Cayos del Marques and determined that this was where the salver was working. This was the big clue. With it, Jean Lyon pieced the whole story together. Within days of the 1622 disaster, a Spanish nobleman with the title the Marquis de Cadarita ordered an immediate search to recover treasure from the Atocha and her sister galleons. When this recovery party arrived on the scene, they had no trouble locating the Atocha because her mizzenmast was still sticking out of the water. But the galleon was so tightly battened that they couldn't break her airtight seal. So they marked the wreck with a buoy 
and went back to Havana to get the right tools. Then fate intervened again. In early October 1622, a second hurricane raked the site. When the Spanish returned with their heavy tools, the buoy was gone and the Atosha had vanished. In spring of 1623, the Marquis launched a new recovery effort, which he personally attended. During his visit to the salvage site, the Spanish camped on the sandy beaches of an unnamed atoll located between the dry Tortugas and modern-day Key West. And my guess is that, that uh, they used those keys uh, as a base camp. It makes sense. And obviously, they named the islands for him, the Cayos del Marques, the Keys of the Marquis. This was the key that unlocked the treasure chest of the Atosha. To Lyon, it was treasure in itself, an example of how history works. The survivors of the hurricane did not say the wrecks were near the Marquesas Keys because they had yet to be named. They said the Matacumbes. What's more, the Marquesas Keys had been named because of the Atosha. Immediately, Lyon contacted Fisher. When Lyon told him the news in early 1970, Fisher was searching an area 40 miles away from the Marquesas Keys. Overnight, he moved his boats to the new spot and started all over again. For months, Fisher scanned the ocean floor, looking for metal objects with magnetometers. By May 1971, they had magged 125,000 linear miles, spent thousands of dollars and countless hours at sea with no luck. Then suddenly, to everyone's excitement, Fisher's team recorded a huge hit. When divers searched the spot, they found a 17th century galleon anchor. It was largely due to Gene's historical work that put Mel and his boats in the ballpark. Then it was up to the remote sensing team. Then it was up to our archeological team. And it was the combination of archival research, remote sensing technology, and archaeological mapping on the seabed, which really allowed us to zero in on the artifact scatter pattern, which stretched over 10 miles of open seabed. Of course, every time we made a significant find, we thought the rest of the whole section would be right around the corner. Within a matter of days, we were going to find the rest of the Atocha, the mother load. But it was, in a way, a false lead. Finding the Atosha's mother load would not come quickly or easily. She had hidden her treasure for 350 years, and she would hide it for 14 more. And when she was finally ready to give it up, she would trade it reluctantly and charge a heavy price in time, money, and most sadly, in precious lives. When Mel Fisher found the anchor of a 17th century galleon in May 1971, he thought about silver, 40 tons of pure silver bars piled high like cords of wood. Fisher was convinced that the anchor was from the Atosha, and soon, he thought, he would find her rich payload of silver. He began calling it the main pile and the mother load. Mel Fisher has been called the world's biggest optimist. And I've known him for almost 25 years, and I can tell you I have never in my life come across anybody with such determination. He sets himself a goal. He sees a picture or a vision of the outcome of this goal, and he heads for it. Naysayers told Fisher that his anchor wasn't from the Atosha that it could have been dropped by any of the 1622 galleons or by another galleon another year. There was no identifying mark on it, and the anchor wasn't talking. But Fisher set the location as ground zero and began digging. For two years, they searched the spot. But by 1973, there was still no proof that they had found the Atosha, nor had they located any sizable amount of treasure. But they were finding valuable artifacts. One day in 1973, Dirk Fisher emerged from the water holding this, a rare navigator's astrolabe. 
This was the most important tool aboard a Spanish galleon, worth a fortune, and further evidence that Fisher had found his ship. When Don Kincaid, the team photographer, found a gold chain, excitement grew. And then divers located a trail of black blobs, the silver coins that became known in pirate lore as pieces of eight. Pottery and tools were one thing, but when Fisher's team found precious metal, trouble began. It's amazing how you can work for so long out there on shipwrecks and not be bothered by people and until you start finding gold and silver and significant objects like that. As soon as we started finding gold and silver in the early 70s, we had state and, and federal government uh, claiming ownership of it. Environmentalists accused Fisher of destroying the wreck site, and this was the beginning of an endless legal nightmare. To answer his critics, Fisher added an important link to his search team, a formally trained archaeologist who, ironically, had no underwater diving experience. When I started with Mel Fisher and his team in 1973, there was very, very little uh, about historic shipwreck archaeology published here in the Americas. And it was largely uh, my working with Mel and the team that we began to see that this really was a pioneering effort. Thus, Fisher's quest for the Atosha became more than just a treasure hunt. It became a hunt for knowledge, both intellectual and precious. And as Fisher's team educated themselves for the hunt, they soon realized they were pioneers in their own right and had an opportunity to educate the world in the process. Soon after Matthewson's arrival, they made big progress. In the spring of 1973, divers found a sizable pocket of black conglomerate, a cache of silver coins, thousands and thousands of them, corroded by 350 years undersea. Many were fused into chunks the size of the wooden boxes that once held them. The find was so rich, they dubbed it the Bank of Spain. For days, divers surfaced with fists full, then buckets full of pieces of eight, and each one was a clue. These are all pieces of eight. As you think about in Treasure Island and so forth, they're black and little cookies. They're found on the bottom, and they eventually will come out as clean as the one I'm wearing. Each coin has its own little history in itself. Most of the silver that was on the Atocha came from the ancient Peruvian mountain of Potosi. Under the whip of Spanish rule, silver was extracted in obscene quantities by Incan labor, processed to incredible purity with deadly mercury, then minted into bar and coin and shipped to Spain. By 1622, the Potosi mine was the richest source of silver in the known world. At Potosi, the Spanish marked every silver bar with its weight in carat, the revenue stamp of the crown, and the individual marks of the mint and assayer. The coins minted at Potosi were literally cut in four denominations. The basic monetary unit was the real. One real was similar in size and weight to a silver dime, two reales to a quarter, four reales were a half dollar, and the eight real coin was a silver dollar containing one ounce of silver. This was the most common coin, the piece of eight. All the coins were stamped with a cross on one side and the royal shield on the other. They were also dated, given a mint mark, P for Peru, and the initial of the assayer. The royal shield changed slightly from king to king. When Philip III died in 1621, his 16-year-old son assumed the throne as Philip IV. At Potosi, the new dyes were in use by 1622. This became an important clue. When Mel Fisher's divers located pieces of eight around the galleon anchor, they were carefully cleaned and studied. Some bore the shield of Philip IV, but none dated after 1622. The divers also found coins stamped with a backwards P and a reversed shield. This was curious indeed. There wasn't a numismatist in the world who had ever seen one of these coins before. Fisher's team noted that the assayer responsible used the initial T for his personal mark. Through archival research, they learned that his name was Juan Jimenez de Tapia, and that he worked at the Potosi Mint between 1619 and 1622. During this period, many of his coins were reversals. In time, 
history would reveal that de Tapia was dyslexic. These coins were certainly rare, but were they proof that Fisher had found the Atosha or one of her sister ships? Fisher was sure, but others wanted more tangible evidence. In May 1973, they got it. Fisher's divers found three silver bars in the middle of the Bank of Spain. Once again, it was archival evidence discovered by Jean Lyon that created the excitement. In Spain, Lyon had found construction records of the Atosha, her passenger list, and her cargo manifest. The manifest listed all of the registered silver bars, and it gave the name of the shipper and the weight of the bar and the bar number. Uh, and then, bang, it occurred to me that if you could find a bar with an inscribed number that matched the manifest, and if you found enough of them where it couldn't be random, then you could identify a Spanish shipwreck. With great anticipation, the three silver bars were brought to Fisher's Key West headquarters to be weighed. Bar number 4584 was the first on the scale. We placed that bar on the scale, and it turned out to be exactly the same weight as Gene indicated from the manifest. That was the first indication that we had that, in fact, the treasure we were now bringing in was from the Nuestra Señora de Atocha. Not only did the bar number match the manifest, but Lyon also knew exactly where it came from. It had been loaded in Cartagena as payment for African slaves. It was true blood money. Fisher's team was thrilled by this evidence. But then came a shot across the bow. Allegations that Fisher had salted the wreck by planting the silver bars. Well, first it was laughable, and then you were furious, and it was a whole uh, mixture of emotions. Um, I think that's one of the reasons why a lot of us stuck with it. We just had to prove to the rest of the world that what we knew and what Mel has been telling everybody all along was true. It was from the Atocha. With increased determination, Fisher's team set out to prove they had the Atosha. But the mother load of the sacred ship remained her secret, and she was about to deliver another tragic blow. When rivals claimed he had salted the Atosha wreck site with silver bars, Mel Fisher became determined to recover something that would prove beyond doubt that he had found the lost galleon. He wanted to find a cannon. What treasure hunters are always looking for is a bronze cannon. Mel always wanted a bronze cannon. He'd never seen one. He'd never had one of his own. In Spain, Lyon had located the arms list for the Atosha, which described her 20 bronze cannon in detail. But finding them was another chore. Fisher thought they might be in the shallow area around the bank of Spain, but his son Dirk and Duncan Mathewson both wanted to look in deeper water because of the developing scattered pattern of Atosha's artifacts. I looked at the ballast rocks, I look at the pot sherds, I look at the barrel hoop fragments, I look at the rusty iron fasteners, I look at all different bits and pieces that were, to me, telling me, speaking to me, that we were going in the wrong direction. Because we were going at, up to the northwest in an area that kept producing the gold and silver and kept helping Mel to meet the payroll. Now, archaeologists have to eat like everybody else. But I began to question that, why are we going to the Northwest when the artifacts were telling us we should be going 180 degrees down to the deeper water, down towards the Southeast? Mapping the artifact scatter pattern was not easy because of Atosha's peculiar fate. Remember, we were dealing with two different hurricanes. The first hurricane sank the ship. She was still basically intact, with all her decks intact, her high stern castle still intact. And it was only later, the month later, that the second hurricane came, broke her up, tore that gun deck off, tore the high stern castle off, and then scattered her over 10 miles to the northwest. 
In the summer of 1975, while most of Mel's boats worked the Bank of Spain, Dirk Fisher took his boat, the North Wind, to search in deep water. On July 13th, the hunch paid off. While free diving 37 feet below the surface, Dirk found five bronze cannon resting on the bottom. Then Pat Klein found four more buried in the mud. Up until that point, there had never been that type of discovery before in American waters or elsewhere around the world. Normally, you might find one or two bronze guns on a shipwreck, but never nine together like that. And that was exciting, and that told me that we really had something special here. The nine bronze cannon were carefully mapped and photographed as they were found. More importantly, they were studied for identifying marks, and they matched with the Atosha's gun list. The cannons pretty much sealed it, uh, not so much for us. We already knew. But for the rest of the world, these bronze cannons that uh, Dirk Fisher found in 1975, I think Mel and the company and, and those of us that were there since the early 70s, we felt vindicated. But at this exhilarating moment, tragedy struck the salvers of the Atosha. A week after finding the bronze cannon, Dirk Fisher, his wife Angel, and diver Rick Gage were sound asleep on the north wind when a pump malfunctioned. Just before dawn, in calm weather, the tug took on water and sank in minutes. There was no time for a rescue, no time to save Dirk, Angel, and Rick. All three drowned. It was a terrible tragedy. And it happened um, uh, at a time where, where we were all so high on a high plateau. And suddenly we were way down in the valley. Dirk and, and, and Angel and, and Rick Gage, they were uh, uh, more than just crew members, they were family. You know, we always watched these, uh, each other's backs out there. We always looked out for each other. And we were young, we were in our 20s. You know, it's one of those things you can live forever when you're that age. And expecting an accident like that is something nobody ever considered. And uh, when it happened, it was devastating. We were, as crew members, ready to throw in the towel ourselves. But Mel said, we need to go on. In Dirk's name, we need to find the rest of the ship. He pointed us now in this new direction. And we did. The search did continue. And it was 10 years to that day of Dirk's death that Mel's other son came, found the mother load of the Atocha. Dirk, Angel, and Rick were not the only ones to perish during Fisher's hunt for the Atosha. The son of a National Geographic photographer was killed when he swam into the propeller of a salvage boat. And another diver simply vanished on his day off. This reminded the entire team of what Gene Lyon called the reality of the Atosha. On the one hand, it's a question of reward for determination, for great effort. Uh, on the other hand, it's, uh, it's a tragedy. It's, you know, five people died in the finding of this treasure. Uh, so I, I can't imagine what treasure is worth uh, all of that. The deaths marked an eerie coincidence. 260 people died aboard the Atosha in 1622, yet five miraculously survived. Centuries later, the Atosha claimed those five lives, almost as if she had traded them for those she had previously spared. In terms of history, the reality of the Atosha was abundantly clear to those who were forever connected to her and to her hallowed treasure. After tragedy struck the Fisher family, the team focused on locating Atosha's mother load. But despite finding her cannons in deep water, Fisher himself was reluctant to abandon the shallow area surrounding the Bank of Spain. 
I went to Mel and I said, Mel, you can keep going up there for the next two decades, up into the Northwest, and continue to find gold and silver. That's terrific. But you're not going to find what you're looking for up there, because what you're looking for is in the opposite direction. Matthewson based his deep water theory on the artifact scatter pattern, where objects were found. And he believed that Dirk's cannons were pointing the way. Finding the nine bronze cannon that Dirk and Angel were, were very, uh, very much involved with told us we were on the right track. But as we realized then, we did not have the whole ship. We only had bits and pieces of it. In simple terms, finding Atosha's mother load amounted to solving an underwater jigsaw puzzle. I really wasn't interested in gold and silver per se. I was interested in where we found the gold and where we found the silver. Between 1975 and 1980, they found numerous artifacts and treasure, but no bonanza. This put tremendous strain on the entire salvage operation. This was compounded by Fisher's legal problems. Fisher held a contract to share 25% of what he recovered from the Atocha with the state of Florida. But after he found gold, all deals were off. Both the state and federal government sued Fisher for the Atocha. These landmark cases ultimately drifted into the United States Supreme Court. The question was simple. Who owned the right to salvage the Atosha? In 1982, Fisher won. The high court ruled that he alone owned the wreck. But the legal troubles continued. Still, nothing swayed Fisher from his goal. Nothing except the discovery of another wreck. In 1980, while searching for the Atosha, Fisher found the trail of her doomed sister ship, the Santa Margarita. Back in 1980, we first found this trail. We brought in about $50 million worth of stuff, and it was very impressive. And since that time, we brought in another 50 or $60 million worth. But the main big pile of it, <laughs> which is about $2 billion worth, is still out there, and I haven't found it yet. So today, they might find it. Maybe today's the day. <laughs> For 16 years, this was Fisher's mantra for success. Today's the day. As it turned out, July 20th, 1985 was the day. After dreaming for so long, Fisher's team finally found it, the mother load of the Atocha. When we found the main pile, it was a reef of silver bars, 40 feet long, 20 feet wide, five feet high of solid silver, 47 tons. Bars were stacked just the way they left Havana Harbor, three and four feet high on the bottom. And just the way Mel described it would be when he told us what we would find when we located the Atocha's mother load. Under Matthewson's supervision, the silver was carefully mapped and photographed as it was found. Then came the daunting task of bringing it all to the surface. It's real hard to swim these 85 pound silver bars to the surface. You know, people tell you these things are lighter underwater. <laughs> no, 85 pounds is 85 pounds underwater. Using milk crates and shopping carts, the team brought the silver up. Then, what they found beneath the silver was even more exciting. Underneath it was a real treasure, which was the, were the timbers. Much of the timber survived because of the silver on top of it, and these huge masses of ribs and footings and planking that the people relied on to get them home were preserved all these years because of that silver. That was terrific. That was terrific, because uh, we had been working for it for so long. And what was exciting for me, not only see it all laid out, a virgin, untouched ship but also making it clear that you could make predictions about the breakup of a wooden hull vessel. This had never been done before. And that, to me, was verification that shipwreck archaeology as a discipline had arrived. After 16 years, the Atosha had finally given up her most treasured secret. The total haul was more than 40 tons of silver, worth hundreds of millions of dollars. But then she added a surprise. Mel always said that when we find the Atocha, not only are we going to find 
stacks and stacks of silver bars and, and the bottoms are going to be covered with gold and, and silver, but we're also going to be finding lots of emeralds. Well, there was no listing on the manifest of any emeralds, so we thought that was just maybe a figment of his imagination. Until six months after we found the mother lode, we were working a little bit uh, north of the main pile. And we were down there vacuuming the sand, and unbeknownst to us, we must have hit a pocket of emeralds. And there we were underwater catching emeralds. We were in an emerald shower. It was beautiful. And that was just the beginning of what is now known today as Emerald City. To date, close to three pounds of rare Colombian emeralds have been recovered from the Atocha. But the bulk of the gems are still out there. It's uh, more than two billion dollars worth still there. But they're not easy to find. We have to work hard. Today, the Atocha site remains very active. Every artifact recovered from the site is brought to Key West, where Fisher operates a world-class conservation laboratory. Our job here in the conservation lab is to make sure that all these objects that we find out there are stabilized, and not just for a couple of years or a brief time while they're put on display, but we want these objects to look the same uh, 100 or 200 or 300 years from now as they do now. Once artifacts are conserved, a representative portion is donated to the Mel Fisher Maritime Heritage Society. The remaining treasure is divided among investors. A $10,000 investment in 1970, for example, was worth as much as $2 million in treasure at the 1985 divide. Much of Fisher's share is for sale at his museum store. Here, rare gold and silver coins are sold daily for thousands and thousands of dollars and beautiful emeralds go for tens of thousands. With the proceeds, Fisher continues to finance the ongoing salvage operation. We're still working on the Atocha today, right this minute, and uh, we're bringing in emeralds every day and other things, coins and gold. A couple of weeks ago, we found a beautiful emerald ring. It's quite unusual. It was appraised at uh, $114,000. And then we also found this one. Look at that beautiful thing. It's very clear and there's ashes of a saint underneath the stone. And this one was appraised at $600. $80,000 for one emerald ring. There's probably a big pile of emeralds there somewhere. We might run into them this afternoon. Never know. <laughs> the greatest irony of Fisher's search for Atosha was that they found her mother load exactly 10 years to the day after the tragic deaths of Dirk Fisher, his wife Angel, and Rick Gage. This deepened the meaning of every item recovered from the wreck. Granted, there's monetary value to everything. This rare coin is worth $100,000. But in concert with history, the value is magnified. A simple plate, for example, might fetch several thousand dollars for its weight in silver. But add a name to the plate and match it to the Atocha's passenger list, and suddenly the Fisher team had uncovered another piece of human history. Who owned the plate? Who perished, bringing it back to Spain? Attached to human lives, the artifacts speak to Fisher's team, and the smallest treasures summon the deepest feelings. I think the items that is the most significant to any of us out there when we find it are the religious items. And you have to understand a little bit of the history of the ship and, and uh, its path of destruction. And you have to know that these people were very strict religious people and they knew they were going to die. And the very last thing that they were doing before they drowned was clutching some religious item. And when you find that underwater, that feeling of being the first person to touch the very last thing they touch is much stronger than any other artifact you can find. It's very emotional.
the real treasure of the Atosha remains the ship herself, brought vividly to life by Mel Fisher's team four centuries after she sank. By revealing her treasures of gold and silver and jewels and more, she tells the tale of an ancient civilization to a modern world. And in telling this tale, she reminds us all that her voyage is ongoing.